Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our leaders development meeting tonight in Jesus name. And I pray that everything we're hearing will be developing us and we go higher and we're better in the service of the Lord from week to week in Jesus name. If we're not better today than, the, than we were last week, or if we're not better this month than last month, the full purpose of the Lord in developing us, reaching out to us, teaching us every time is not being fulfilled. And so we should present ourselves to the Lord, a mind, a heart, a spirit, a brain, and everything we have so that every study will do something definite in every life in Jesus' name. I pray that today the Lord will give us a searching heart and obedient heart so that, well, we're not, I heard that before, I knew that before, even though you've heard it before and you've read the scriptures before, I pray that God's mind will be revealed to everyone. Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name because you are a good God, a great God. And you want your children, you want your sons and daughters, you want our leaders, you want our pastors, you want everyone involved in the work of God in particular to arise and to go further than we ever knew in Jesus' name. And we're asking, O oh Lord, that your word will mean, will mean something definite to every life that will not take your word with a shallow mind, with an unreasoning heart, but with a heart that wants the word to do a transforming work in our leadership role, in our pastoral role, and in our teaching role in the church and evangelistic role in the world in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody shout a good amen. amen. God bless you. Consider we're coming to Matthew chapter 20. And in Matthew chapter 20, we're reading from verses 1 to 7. And then verses 20 to 24. And the latter part, verses 30 to 34. Look at that. Matthew chapter 20 from verse 1. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers, to bring laborers into, the, into his vineyard. Then in verse 2, it tells us, And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day. He had agreed with those laborers for a penny a day. It's not our penny, it's not our naira, it's not our dollar, it's not our pound, a penny. That was the day's wage at that time. He sent them into his vineyard. In verse 3, he tells us, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Verse 4 tells us, it says, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. You remember, you see at this time, he didn't promise them any particular wages. He said, I'll give you whatever is right. Now in verse 5, it says in verse 5, again, he went out about the six hour and the ninth hour and did and did likewise then in verse 6 it tells us and about the eleventh hour the eleventh hour mean 5 p.m for us because they, they started at six o'clock and the third hour will be nine o'clock and the sixth hour will be twelve o'clock the ninth hour will be three o'clock in the afternoon now he's telling us that he went out at the eleventh hour eleventh hour calculating from six a.m this is five p.m now and then it says he went out and found others standing 
idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? Then in verse 7, it says in verse 7, They say unto him, Because no man has hired us. And he says unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right. Again, he didn't say, I'll give you a penny at the end of time. They just trusted him. It's a good householder. It's a good master. It's a good employer. And he did it. It wasn't specific. He said, whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. And then they went to work. Now we're looking at verse 20. In verse 20 of that same chapter, it says, When then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children, that's of James and John, with her sons, worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. You understand? And some people's worship can be colored. So people's worship can have a kind of um, a, a reason behind it. They are worshiping not because they are worshiping unconditionally, not because they are worshiping from their heart, and they are worshiping Him as the King, as the Lord, as the one that saved them or sanctified them or had brought them into the kingdom. The mother of James and John, she came, of course, with agreement with James and John that one will sit here and one will sit there when our worship is not sincere when our worship is not transparent when our worship is not totally committed to the Lord unconditionally that worship is not accepted in the sight of the Lord then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshipping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Then in verse 21, in verse 21 it says, And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Remember, in the previous chapter, the Lord Jesus had promised all the disciples, he said, you will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That was not enough for James and John to sit on the throne and what Christ who is the chief judge now to be judging the 12 types of Israel that wasn't enough for them they wanted a kind of privilege favor given to them that I will sit there and you will sit there yes the Lord had said whatsoever we ask he will give us but whatsoever we ask should depend upon the will of God, the, the promise of God in particular unto us. But now she said, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, it tells us, But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup? that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I shall be I am baptized with they said unto him we are able understand the promises of God and the reward is conditional there are people that think that you know whoever you are you're a believer whoever you are you're a worker whether you are a low worker or a high worker a committed worker a faithful worker or not the reward will come he said are you able you're asking for this reward you're asking for this position and you're asking for this place are you able to do what it takes and to go all the lengths it will take so that you'll ask what you're asking for. You they said, Yes, we're able in verse 23. In verse 23, it tells us, it says, and he says unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. Have you heard what Jesus said? He said, you know, the Father has his responsibility and his right. 
I have my responsibility and my role. And that role you are asking for is not in my hand. Do we understand that? That you as a pastor, there is a, there is a kind of role you have. And you know this is not your right to give that thing to another person. Do you understand that as a worker in the vineyard of the Lord, you cannot take the money belonging to the church and say, I, I pity this by pity this person no the offering is collected and then you deposit in the bank we have the people that have the role to consider how we give out the charity and then they do that you stay in your role i stay in my right and then we're able to do the work of god like jesus christ would have done it and so we understand our calling we understand our ministry and we understand what God has placed in our hand and whatever he has not placed in our hand. Say, no, no, I cannot do that. That is the prerogative and the responsibility of the almighty God. And so he said, but to see it on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father and then he tells us in verse 24 in verse 24 it says and when the ten heard it they were moved with indignation indignation that's exactly what the pharisees had in their hearts whenever jesus christ performed the miracle and they were not comfortable with that they would be filled with indignation isn't it something shocking that the disciples of the lord jesus christ for any reason seen at all will have the same emotion and the same passion and the same anger and the same indignation as the enemies of Christ had but here is the fact they, they were moved and were filled with indignation against the two brethren we're looking at verse 30 here in verse 30 it tells us it says and behold two blind men sitting by the wayside when they had heard that Jesus passed by he cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Verse 31. In verse 31, and the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more saying, have mercy on us, O Lord, our son of David. Verse 32, in verse 32 it says, And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I, should, I shall do unto you? Verse 33, in verse 33 they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. Then verse 34, it says, So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes and immediately their eyes were received sight and they followed him in the way. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, number one is the future and the destiny of people sinning through idleness. The people that sin through idleness, sinning because there's nothing to do and Satan gives those idle hands what to do and they respond to that and do that and they have a future and they have a destiny. Number two is the folly and danger of position seeking with indignation. Seeking position with indignation by the way have you noticed that you know it says and the ten when they heard james john 2 the 10 12 that includes judas iscariot judas iscariot of all people was even indignant and angry why is judas angry What's the matter with Judas Iscariot? He himself had been stealing money from the poor, as the treasurer of the team. He himself had the ambition 
He was going to betray Jesus Christ. He was going to sell Jesus into the hands of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and of all people. This man was also seeking position. He also wanted to be in a conspicuous place. And so this backslider and this prodigal apostle and this one who has sold his heart his life for money and he was going to hell anyway he also was so indignant and angry why james and john should say they wanted to occupy this position you know sometimes people don't uh, think about their eternal destiny and they do not think about that they're backsliders they're prodigal people prodigal sons or prodigal daughters and when they hear that other people do something you know, that the regular people believers do not agree with they are still angry they are still angry uh, that's what we're talking about about the folly and the danger of position seeking with indignation. Number three here is the faith and deliverance of passionate seekers and indigents. They are indigents, they are poor, and they have nothing to take care of themselves, and they are blind, and yet they had the faith for their deliverance, even though they didn't have anything to pay. The faith and the deliverance of passionate seekers and indigents. We're coming to number one. Number one, we're looking at the future and the destiny of people sinning through idleness. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 20. I was looking at verse 3. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 3, it says, And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And then in verse 6, it says in verse 6, and about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and says unto them, why stand ye here idle all the day? Idle all the day. Then in verse 11, in verse 11 we're told that when he had received, uh, when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. There are three things we're looking at uh, from this uh, subtitle. Number one is the slothfulness and suffering of the idle soul. The suffering and the slothfulness of the idle soul. Number two, the standing and the spiritual stage of idle servants. Idle servants. What's their standing in the kingdom? And what is their spiritual stage in relation to their service? Because they're supposed to be spiritual servants and they're supposed to serve the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. And yet they stood idle. Number three is the sinfulness and the seriousness of idle statements. Idle statements. Look at number one there. Number one here is the slothfulness and the suffering of the idle soul. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 19 and we're reading from verse uh, from verse 15 in Proverbs chapter 19 verse 15 slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep and an idle soul shall suffer hunger even in the natural even in the physical even in the work of our hands so we earn uh, some money so we can take care of ourselves and take care of our families and take care of our children and take care of our rents and everything the idle soul will suffer hunger uh, there are people that uh, depend on scraps on leftovers on you know what comes from other people we well, thank the lord for those uh, who are generous enough to give to those who are poor but you know that will never satisfy and that will never meet all your needs how can you meet all your needs by just depending on other people you will not walk you stand idle you stay idle how can you take care of your 
family of your wife? How can you take care fully of your children, sending them to school and doing everything if you are idle and you're only depending on brother so and so and sister so and so? They will not be able to carry all your expenses. That's the reason why you're a child of God, even in normal things, even in financial things, even in physical things, even in natural things, what to be up and doing because. The idle soul will suffer hunger. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 18. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 18. By much slothfulness, the building decayed. Even if the building was rented for you by another person and you are idle, even they were paying house rent for you by other people and you are idle, all the cries and all the you are not even able to you know stand up and clean that house you are so idle you are not able to you know do whatever is necessary to keep that house you must understand that idleness does not pay at all whether we are saved or we are not saved and whether we are sanctified or not sanctified idleness does not pay we have to then turn around and say if my house is not going to collapse if my temple, my body is not going to collapse if all my desires and all my aspirations are not going to collapse I must do something you know, and then we turn around and we walk to the point where because God had said out of our sweat shall we have all that we're going to have seized by much slothfulness the building decayed and through idleness of the hands the house dropped through there'll be leaks on the roof there'll be cracks in the walls there'll be a lot of things we'll not be mentioning that are not good for that house that will just be there because the tenant there the believer there is idle now we're looking at ezekiel chapter 16 and i'm reading from verse 48 ezekiel chapter 16 verse 48 as i live says the lord god sodom thy sister hath not done she nor her daughters as thou hast done thou and thy daughters what was the sin and what was the evil of the people in sodom look at verse 49 in verse 49 it said behold this was the iniquity the transgression this was the evil and this was the um, terrible infirmity of thy sister Sodom pride fullness of bread and abundance of idleness do you know when you're idle you are not walking. You say you are born again, but you are not walking. You say you are born again. Your hands are always at your back. Your hands, I can't soil my hand. I can't. The work that's available, I'm a graduate, and I cannot do all that kind of work. And then other people that are graduates too, and they're doing the work they are doing. They are the people. They are supplying your need, and then you are not even ashamed. You, you know, every time you say, "My brother, can you raise me there with this and this? Are you going to pay?" back am i going to pay back i'm not walking now it says you are like the people in sodom and you don't think about that 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 very serious and that's biting it says in verse 49 it says behold verse 49 it says behold this was the iniquity the sin of thy sister sodom pride were too proud to do what's available to be done and fullness of bread would eat too much and because we eat too much we're so heavy and of course we have the problem with obesity and we have the problem with tiredness i'm always tired i eat so much it says that was their sin an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters neither did she strengthen the hands of the poor and the needy verse 50 in verse 50 it says and they were haughty and they committed abomination before me therefore i took 
them away as I saw good. We're coming to number two here. Number two, we're looking at the standing and spiritual stage of idle servants. Idle servants. We're coming to Matthew chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 20 verse 6 and about the 11th hour he went out and found others standing idle. At the 11th hour standing idle. That was the 11th hour of that day. But look at our lives. If you look at our lives, well, the early hours of our life, we should have gone to school. We should have trained ourselves. We should have had something we ought to do at the early hours. Or maybe we were went at the mid hours of the day. That's at the sixth hour of the day. In the middle of life that was say, yes, I got certificate, but I need something practical. In the life we live today, if I stayed with my original education, and the education I had at that time may not have any work now, is there something I can do today that will earn me a living? And so, at the mid life, mid time hour of our lives, some of us will go to learn computer because that's the in thing now. Because without the use of that computer and a lot of things cannot be achieved or maybe you want to learn another trade or whatever so that you can be employable and so it says at the 11th hour here we are at the 11th hour of life and a lot of time has gone in life you are the, um, at, the, at, the uh, at the later hours of your life maybe on your 70 but and you have retired from your place of work can you still get something done? Because if you don't exercise the brain, if you don't exercise the limbs, if you don't exercise your body, you will you might die earlier than you should. That's what research has found out. Research has found out that the people who retire and at the end of the retirement period, they become like, they're not doing anything. They're idle. They're not developing themselves. The brain will be getting weaker. The body will be getting weaker. There's no exercise and you're not learning anything new. In fact, the experts in that area, they advise us that as you are getting getting older and getting older and you're reaching your 11th hour of your life get something new that you know before maybe you learn a new language maybe you will learn something maybe music maybe you will learn computer maybe you will learn the things that are going on now that you are totally ignorant of they say that when you learn a new thing like that and you're able to make use of that new thing they say it will keep your brain active it will keep your life it will keep everything you have you'll be healthier in Jesus name. Show me somebody who sleeps all through the day, all through the week and he just you know, rolling on the bed and then when, he, when he's hungry he goes there if he's still able to stand up and then he drinks all that tea or whatever or you know some food. After that food he goes back again. Those who have done research on such people they tell us that you know, everything packs up all your system but when at the 11th hour of your life, you're still able to get something done, I pray the Lord will keep you healthy. And the Lord will keep you profitable to your country, to your community in Jesus' name. And so it says, and about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle and says unto them, why stand ye here all the day? day idle. Look at the first part of verse 7. In verse 7 it tells us, and they say unto him, because no man has hired us. No man has hired us. Well, look at the last part there, and he says unto them, if you could meet with Christ, if Christ could speak to you, whatever your age, However old you are, if the Lord could come to you and have connection, communication, consultation with him, he'll tell you what can be done. The Lord will speak to you.
He says unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, the same vineyard that the younger people at the earlier hours that they have gone. He says to this eleven hour people, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right that shall ye receive. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Are looking at Proverbs chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 13. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 13. The slothful man says, There is a lion in the way. That's his imagination. And a lion is in the street. That's his imagination. It's imagining it's not safe for me to go out. Others are going out. Even sinners are going out. Others are doing their the marketplace and they're walking. But this idle man, this idle woman, this idle believer, uh, this idle believer is uh, saying, your lions are there, dangers are there, I cannot go. Those who don't have any protection from God, they're going out and they're walking. And the people that have total protection from the Lord, they're afraid and they're saying they cannot go out. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, is as the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth his lawful man upon his bed. Have you noticed how idle people do this? Okay, I must, I must walk now. I must be up and doing. And then they set the alarm. I'm going to wake up. Now I'm going to change. And I'm going to wake up and they put the alarm clock there. Well, the people who are experts in this area that is for us to be up and doing, they said if you can set about two, three alarms and put them in different places far away when you are where you're sleeping. They say that one will strike up. Maybe this one is two minutes after it will strike up. Even if you are lazy and you are sleeping because those alarm clocks on your phone now, it, they're in different places and they disturb you. They won't even allow you to enjoy the sleep. You'll be forced to rise. So, but when you put all those alarms, like, you know, very near, as you are, as you are hearing the alarm, your eyes are say close, you stretch your and then you stop that. If that one is also near, you stop that and you can sleep another hour, another two hours. But if we really want to take the lesson to heart and we want to serve the Lord, it says, As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth his slothful man upon his bed. In verse 15, verse 15 tells us, The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom. He grieveth. It grieveth him to, to bring it again to his mouth. And then he tells us in verse 16, it says in verse 16, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Let's suspend all that wisdom we are using to make us idle and to make us remain unprofitable even in natural work and then in the spiritual work. It tells us in Matthew chapter 25, I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 25, we're reading from verse 25. It says then, he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man. This man did not know the Lord. This man did not know our shepherd. This man did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I know you that you are a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. In verse 25, it says in verse 25, and I was afraid this one is not sheep in the fold. The sheep is not afraid of the shepherd. The disciple is not afraid of a master. The apostles were not afraid of our Lord. But this one says, you can see, this is a stranger in the kingdom. They have wrong thoughts toward Christ. Wrong thoughts toward a savior. Wrong thoughts towards a shepherd. He said, I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, thou, there thou hast 
what that is thine. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, and, the, and his Lord answered and said unto him, The wicked and slothful servant. Uh, that, that, that was a challenge. All the other things you are not had, master, and you're expecting what you know. So all that is excuse. The real reason is that this was a wicked and slothful servant. Wicked, sinful, wicked, backsliding, wicked, not submissive to the Lord, to the Master. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. In verse 27, it says, Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming, at my return, I should, I should have received my own with interest, with usury. And it tells us in James chapter 4, verse 17, James chapter 4, verse 17, it says, He that therefore to him that knoweth to do good, but because of idleness, he doeth it not. To him that knoweth how to do good, because of laziness, he doeth it not. To him that knoweth to do good, because of habitual indolence, he doeth it not. To him that knoweth to do good, and he doeth it not. To him it is sin. Therefore, idleness, not working at all, not working to earn your living and not working in the kingdom because of idleness, because of excuses, it is sin in the sight of the Lord. We're looking at number three. Number three, the sinfulness and the seriousness of idle statements. We're coming to Matthew chapter 20, and I'm reading here from verse 11. Matthew chapter 20, we're reading from verse 11. In verse 11, when they had received age, they murmured against the good man of the house. As we're walking in the Lord's vineyard, as we're walking in the kingdom, if we're murmuring, if you murmur, some words are coming from your mouth and some statements are coming, they are idle statements. We are, we're not thinking through and we're not thinking, we're not understanding that every idle word shall be judged of the Lord and therefore we're uttering those idle, idle statements, idle words, idle conversation and the the complaint and the murmuring and the sin in the sight of the Lord. And then it says in verse 12, in verse 12 it says, saying, these last have wrought but one hour and thou hast made them equal unto us which have borne the body in and the heat of the day then in verse 13 in verse 13 he answered one of them and said friend i do thee no wrong did not thou agree with me for a penny in verse 14 it says take that Thine, take that thine is that is what belongs to you and go your way I will give unto this last even as unto thee then in verse 15 in verse 15 it says is it not lawful is it not right for me to do what I will with mine own with mine own resources is thine eye evil because I am good. In Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 34. Matthew chapter 12, we're looking at verse 34, generation of vipers. How can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. In verse 36, in verse 36, it says, But I say unto you that every idle word, every idle statement, every idle complaint, every idle murmuring, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Verse 37, verse 37 says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt 
be condemned. First Timothy chapter 5, reading from verse 12. In First Timothy chapter 5, verse 12, having damnation because they, are, they have cast off their first faith. They've cast off their first faith. When we first came into the kingdom, the first love, they've cast that off. The first faith, they've cast that off. The first loyalty, they have cast that off. The first faithfulness, they've cast that off. Now, they might even go on walking and walking, but they are idle in prayer. They are idle in consecration. They are idle in thoughtfulness. They do not think as to what they say. And what they say against the Lord. What they say against the Lord's church. What they say against their fellow brothers and sisters. They've cast off the forced restraint. The restraint we used to have. I know that God is a listener to every conversation. So I will not allow idle talk. I don't word, I don't statement to come out of my mouth. They have let that forced commitment unto the Lord. It says having damnation because they have cast off their false faith. What do they do now? What are they engaged in now? Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, in verse 13, and with that, they learn to be idle. They learn to be idle. It's like they, somebody is training them. Their mind is training them how to shirk their duty, how to drop their responsibility and just be looking at other people and they have cast off their false faith and their false love and they don't have any, any thinking, constructive thinking on other people now because all the false commitment and consecration and seriousness and sobriety, all that is gone. And now they learn to be idle wandering about from house to house and not only idle but they are tacklers, talkatives also and busy bodies in other people's matters and speaking, speaking things which they ought not the Lord is telling us this so we can examine ourselves and say where do I stand do I still have my first faith my first love, my first commitment, my first thoughtfulness and my first regard that I had for the Lord and I have for the body of Christ. We're looking at number two here. Number two, it tells us about the folly and the danger of position seeking with indignation. Uh, to start with, those of us who are believers, by the grace of God, have we parted completely with anger? Have we parted completely with indignation? Or is our life now bogged down and pinned down and our life is defiled now, surrounded with indignation? What are you angry about? Who are you angry at? It's not your boy. It's not your, you know, it's not your slave. It's not, you know, somebody under you in your house. You have right to be angry and to be indignant. Other people, they are saying something that's between them and the Lord. Even if they are complaining, they are murmuring, do you have right to have indignation? Whatever we're doing, let us think through, do I have right to be angry at that? That fellow is careless. Is he responsible to me? Is he not responsible to God? That fellow is, uh, you know, is going to ask something. That's between him and the Lord. I want to be on this side. And then my brother to be on that side. The Lord is a good God. He will judge that. He will respond properly. Why do I have to be angry at that? Leave everybody in the hands of the Lord. And allow me to say this in a very good way. Mind your business. Your business of keeping your own soul saved. Your business of keeping your life straight. And your business of making sure that you are running the race. You are not looking here. You are not running there. So that you can make it to heaven. The hour is late. The time is late. Christ will come anytime from now and this is not the time for you to drop your responsibility your own soul and
and your own life and then you are concerned about other people and you are grumbling and grumbling or sometimes maybe I am preaching I'm responsible to God when I'm preaching I, I said it I think maybe yesterday Monday and I said people what they were thinking how could the pastor say that I said when I was younger when I was born again I was really born again and I had to make restitution because I don't GC exam for other people how could uh, the pastor say that that's not your business that's mine I'm preaching and what God puts in my heart, I say. And then I said, I recorded all the promises of God and the PDF. And then I got the MP3 and I listen to that every day. Why should the preacher, the pastor say that? That's not your business now. That's my business. I'm telling the people what I need to tell them. And therefore, there's no, there's no room for indignation. There's no room for anger. There's no room for, uh, I think we need to do something to correct this man. He's not too free. Shouldn't I be free in preaching and in talking? Uh, the son, therefore, shall make me free. I shall be free indeed. Give me a good day. Amen. amen. And the same freedom I have, I've already transferred it to everyone that listens to me. That the same grace and the same upholding power that the Lord has given me, I said, you will have as well. If you are going, why don't you go and pray? Why didn't you go and do what I do? If you don't have a PDF or MP3 on your tablet, why don't you go and read the promises directly? In fact, I'm going to tell you another thing. If you get Dick's annotated Bible, and you are reading the Exodus Bible. He has a sign before every prophecy. He has a sign for every command. He has a sign for every promise. And if you have not been able to get the one I spoke about, pick a dig. And as you are reading, you see the sign he puts on every promise. And then you can go through Genesis and look at the promises, Exodus, and look at the promises and all over the Bible. And when you do that, it will strengthen your faith. I said it will strengthen your faith. I'm going to tell you another thing. Is that all right? Of course. It's very funny if you say no, I'm still going to say it anyhow. Well, we're going to have the crusade in 1985. And that time I wasn't used to crusades. What I did was I recorded all the life of Elijah and the life of Elisha and then that time we used to have the transistor uh, the recorder and then I'll put the cassette there and it has turned over by itself every night every night weeks before that crusade I listened to that I listened to that I listened to that because I wasn't used to crusades I wasn't used to, used to praying for the blind and praying for the sick and that helped a lot and then when we got to that crusade 1985 December uh, you know from all that I listened to every night everything was in my system and that same power began to operate at that time I've thrown that at you now extra you will do it you will rise higher and you will be able to do that there's no other secret I'm telling you all my secret and what I did when I was weak I became strong when I didn't have enough faith how the faith grew and when there were no miracles how the miracles came I pray it will happen in your life in Jesus name. so there is no indignation there is no anger against me against anybody allow me to be free i have allowed you to be free and the lord will bless me and continue to bless you even as he's blessing me in jesus name in matthew chapter 20 matthew chapter 20 and i'm reading from verse 20 then came to him the mother of zebedee's children and with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him in verse 21 in verse 21 it says and he said unto her what wilt thou she says unto him grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom verse 22 in verse 22 it says and Jesus answered and said ye know not what she asked are ye able to drink 
of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with they said unto him we are able then in verse 23 it tells us in verse 23 it says and he says unto them ye shall indeed drink of the cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give but uh, it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father and then in verse 24 in verse 24 it says and when the ten heard it even Peter when the ten had it, even Andrew, when the ten had it, even Matthew himself, that is uh, recording and writing this for us, when the ten had it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. There are three things we're looking at here. We're looking at number one, the self-centeredness of unsanctified position seekers. James and John, self-centeredness, that they thought only about themselves and the Lord wanted them to love others like themselves and to love every disciple as he has loved them. No, they will not consider other people, they only considered what they wanted the self-centeredness of unsanctified position seekers number two the sorrow of the unsuspected private schemer the one who is scheming in part in the private i'll take that position i'll have that position and they're already working at it because they are scheming the sorrow that comes to them, even though people will not suspect that they are seeking people, scheming people in private. Number three, the sanctification of unswervingly persuaded saints. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at um, number one here. It's the self-centeredness of unsanctified position seekers. Look at um, Mark chapter 10 in verse 35. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Ah, but it said it's the mother that came to Jesus in Matthew. And Mark is telling us that James and John, the sons of the baby, they came unto Jesus themselves. Yes, they were the people that actually had the mind. The, the, the mother of James and John did not initiate it. They initiated it. And actually they came and they brought their mother along. And it was the mother that said, can you do something for me? Actually, James and John put watch in his mouth. And when Jesus said, are you able to drink? They were there. And they said immediately, yes, we're able to drink it. And we're able to be baptized with the baptism. You'll be baptized with they were the people that had that unsanctified proposal, that unsanctified heart, and that unsanctified inclination. You understand now, before Jesus died, why he was praying for them, sanctify them through thy truth, the word is truth by their action, by their desire, by even their prayer, and by their petition, they had not yet been sanctified. And if any of us, if we have anything like that today in heart, that means we are not sanctified. If we want this position, and we are using whatever techniques to drive other people away from that position, and we are protecting that position as if it's ours, we must be there. If we are not there in control, in charge, nothing 
will work out very well. That means we are not sanctified. And without sanctification and holiness, no one shall see the Lord. We cannot carry that unsanctified heart and that unholy heart and that unrighteous place-seeking disposition. We cannot carry that and go to heaven. It says, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for for us whatsoever we shall desire. You remember James was very intimate with Christ and he would lean a sedge on the bosom of Christ and even people they knew that you know Jesus loved John in a way that it was special and John thought he was going to take Jesus for granted. And because of the intimacy, because of the nearness, and because of the familiarity came, can I have this? We must never use our intimacy with leadership. We must never use our closeness to leadership as something that you then twist and said, give me this. After all, you love me more than all the other people. That will not be right. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 45, and I'm reading from verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 45, we're looking at verse 5. It says, seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. A child of God, a believer, a servant of God. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. What does that mean? It means if I want, if I want power, why? Am I seeking for that power for myself or to help other people? Seekest thou great things for thyself? I'm seeking a particular gift. Am I seeking that so as to lift myself up? My position and my popularity. If, it, if that is the reason, seek them not. If it's to help people, people are suffering and people are sick and people are down. And I want to have the gift to bring them up, to lift them up. That's right. But if it's for myself, so that people will know how great I am, people will know how high I am, people will know how powerful I am. He says, seekest thou great things for thyself, seek them not. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, says the Lord, but thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. Let's come to number two there. Number two there is the sorrow of the unsuspected private schemer. Uh, you remember Absalom? Absalom was a schemer. But he wanted position. He wanted that place. But he was a schemer. And then a heat of hell, a wise man who had been a wise counselor unto David. And now when Absalom brought out this proposition that, you know, I am going to take over from this man. This man, David, when is he going to die? Let him get out of the way. And I am the next person. And Adonijah is, was older than Absalom. And Absalom will not wait for Adonijah or anybody. I am the next. I am the next. And it comes to exactly how they plan it on that other side. And they say, I'm the next, I'm the next, I'm the next. And because of that, there is this private scheming and the sorrow of those people that nobody will suspect. And yet, here was the problem. We're looking at Matthew chapter 20, verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Uh -huh. They had the mind as well. Look at James chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14. In James chapter 3, reading from verse 14, he's still talking about this envy and about this bitterness and about this 
scheming and wanting to have that and they have the wisdom the wisdom of the world the wisdom of the flesh and the wisdom of the devil it says in James chapter 3 verse 14 but if ye have bitter envy and strive in your heart glory not and lie not against the truth then in verse 15 in verse 15 it says this wisdom descended not from above any wisdom that is scheming to scheme to outplay another person to displace another person to push another person away so that i can be there and then there's this uh, background talk there's this background conspiracy there's this background scheming any wisdom that does that so that you can be over there it says this wisdom descended not from above but it is earthly and sensual and devilish you know what I would have done if I was in that situation and I knew this position even if I grabbed it even if I got it that it will take heaven away from my hand I will humbly go back to where I got that position and say I'm sorry I don't fit into this I can't that's what is called restitution that the way I got it and the way I'm thinking about it and the way I sold my soul and I sold and let my sanctification and my holiness go so I can have this I don't merit it I want to give it up so that I can remain the Christian that is saved and sanctified and holy and humble and submissive in the hands of the Lord and when Christ comes and is coming soon so that I will get to heaven I don't want to be an Absalom I don't want to be a Judas Iscariot I don't want to be a scheming James or a scheming John I want my life to be totally given to him without wanting back any unlawful gain it says this kind of wisdom the scheming wisdom descended not from above but is earthly and sensual and devilish and then he tells us uh, in uh, verse 16 it says in verse 16 for where envy and strife is in any heart where there's envy and strife in any heart where there's scheming in any heart when there's place seeking position seeking where envy and strife is there is confusion and every evil work we'll come to number three here number three the sanctification of unswervingly persuaded saint here is the saint of god here is a child of god and here is somebody who is saved and he knows he knows beyond any shadow of doubt that without his sanctified heart that the depraved heart and the original heart and the sinful heart and the place seeking heart and the heart that is pushing other people down so he can walk over them and get somewhere he knows that kind of heart cannot get to heaven so he's persuaded beyond any shadow of doubt and he's unswervingly persuaded as a child of God he will go to God in prayer and be sanctified in 2 Timothy reading from chapter 2 2 Timothy chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 19 nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure having their seal the Lord knoweth them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity verse 21 in verse 21 it tells us it says if a man if a woman if any believer therefore purge himself purge herself from these from what from scheming from what from envy from what from strife from what from the wisdom that comes from the devil if a man therefore purge himself from this he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified 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 and meet for 
the master's use and prepared unto every good work. I just want to serve. Prepared unto every good work. Pay or no pay, I want to serve. If the pay will come at last, and the Lord did not even promise, uh, you know, those other sets of servants anything he was going to pay, they just said, I will give you what is right in the future. And so you are satisfied with that because he sanctifies your heart. He purifies your heart. He purges your heart that you don't have any scheming. You're not playing any game. You're not gambling with your soul so that you can have earthly things and then miss heaven. It tells us in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 3 there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 we're reading from verse 3. For this is the will of God even your sanctification even your sanctification look at verse look at verse 4 in verse 4 it tells us that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor look at verse 5 in verse 5 not in the laws of concupiscence even as the gentiles which know not God. It says in verse 6, in verse 6 it says that no man go before, beyond, and defraud his brother. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother. You know, uh, two brothers have been praying together and this brother A has seen the will of God to Sister D. And then A brother came to tell B brother. And he said, Praise the Lord. I've known the will of God. Ah, is that so? Who is the person? Sister D. And they are praying together, praying together. And the other brother, the second brother, will go behind. And one way or the other, He's gone to the marriage committee and he's going to give the name of that sister D. And then he's showing up and, and they're still praying together. My friend, what kind of prayer is that? I told you what the Lord revealed to me. And I said this, can we pray together? Yes, we can pray together. And you go behind to defraud. Don't tell me you're a child of God. Don't tell me you're born again. Somebody has a work. He has not discovered. Vacancy is there. Please, my brother, come. Let's pray together. My sister, let's pray together. And then we're praying together. And I'm closing my eyes. And he is not closing his eyes. He opens his eyes. While I'm closing my eyes and we're praying, he's gone to get that job. Ah, but I told you now, why are we doing like this? I was still saying we're saved. We're born again. We're sanctified. Sanctification on paper, but not in the heart. He says that he wants us to be sanctified. And when we're sanctified, all this kind of uh, game playing and scheming that uh, well, we have salvation, we have sanctification. If we have sanctification, let no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. I came to you and I said, my brother, I'm having some challenges. And I'm thinking this brother may be involved in those challenges. But I can't talk to him because I might make a mistake. I might, I might be misjudging him. So if I go to tell him, say, ah, you say I did that kind of thing. Okay, you've not said anything. I, he gets angry. So I don't want to go that direction. Can you pray with me so that this problem and this challenge I have everything will be all right so that i can you know live at peace and you i told you in confidence and you go to the brother i was talking about and then you open up everything and you say the pastor said ah ah sanctification how can you do that and then that fellow now will not come to me but you've given him a real weep in his hand to really get angry that doesn't show whatever name you are called 
You might be called overseer, state overseer, national overseer, region overseer, group pastor, or district pastor. There's no evidence of salvation in that kind of life. That's scheming. The Lord says when we're sanctified, our lives will be totally different, and we will not be doing things like we're defrauding other people that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all sort as we also have forewarned you and testified. May the Lord help us to purge ourselves from all these uh, kind of characters of the unsanctified in Jesus name. That amen is good but give me another one that is better. We're looking at, we're looking at uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're looking at verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And then in verse 23, it says in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray that your whole spirit and your whole soul and your whole body be preserved, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 24 it tells us it says faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it he will do it in our lives we're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 13 uh, and I'm reading from verse 12 uh, it says well for Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate in verse 13 it says, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach in verse 14 for we for here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come i pray the lord will get us ready make us ready for the coming of the lord in jesus name we're looking at uh, number three now number three uh, the faith and deliverance of passionate seekers and indigents the faith and the deliverance of passionate seekers and indigents. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one is the persistent importunity of the blind. Number two is the pitiable ignorance of the blind. Number three is the purposeful instructors of the blind. We're looking at number one, the persistent opportunity of the blind. In Luke chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 35. Luke chapter 18, verse 35, and it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And in verse 36, it tells us, and hearing the multitude pass, pass by, he asked what it meaneth. What it meant. And in verse 37, it says, And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. Verse 38, in verse 38, and he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 39, in verse 39, and they which went before. <clears throat> They which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. In verse 40, then it says in verse 40, Jesus and Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him in verse 41, saying what wilt thou that I should do unto thee and he says Lord that I might receive my sight that I might receive my sight verse 42 in verse 42 and Jesus said unto him receive thy sight thy faith thy faith thy faith has saved thee verse 43 in verse 43 and immediately he received the sight and he followed him glorifying God and all the people when 
they saw it gave praise unto the Lord. And you see what helped these blind men is their importunity. Importunity. And Jesus said, when we pray, we keep on praying and praying until the answer comes. In Luke chapter 11, reading here from verse 8, Luke chapter 11, verse 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend yet because of his importunity because of his importunity because of asking and asking and asking because of his importunity it says he will rise and give him as many as he needed in jeremiah chapter 29 reading from verse 12 Jeremiah chapter 9, reading from verse 12, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will akin unto you. How do we pray that kind of prayer that the Lord said they will akin unto us? Verse 13, in verse 13 it says, And ye shall seek me, and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Look at the second point there. Uh, the second uh, thing here is the pitiable ignorance of the blind. In John chapter 9, reading from verse 40, John chapter 9, we're reading from verse 40. Some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words. And said unto him, Are we blind also? Are we blind also? They were asking that question to tell the Lord Jesus, We are not blind, are we? Look at verse 41. In verse 41, Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Are we blind also? Well, if our sins have not been taken away, yes, we're blind. Are we blind also? If we're in a habit, a destructive habit, a dangerous habit, a habit that will hinder us from getting to heaven and will remain like that, not doing anything about that evil, sinful, destructive habit, and we still remain like that, are we blind also? Yes, you are. Because if the sins are there, and we're not convicted of that sin, and we're not converted from that sin, we're still blind. It tells us in um, Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 16. Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 16. It says, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. And then in verse 17, verse 17 says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It says there are people that say, oh, we're all right, we're rich, rich in faith and rich in Christian profession, and yet they look warm. And the Lord is saying, because you do not recognize your lukewarmness, you do not recognize your cold attitude towards the Lord. Because you do not recognize you are not where you ought to be and you are not ready for the rapture and yet you are still boasting that everything is alright. Can I tell you, you are miserable, you are wretched, you are, uh, you are poor, you are naked and you are blind. What are we to do? Look at verse 18. In verse 18 it says, I counsel thee, here is Christ talking, I counsel thee to buy up me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and uh, anoint thine eyes with 
I serve that thou may see. In verse 19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And will fellowship with him and abide with him and he with me. We're coming to number number three here. Number three, the purposeful instructors of the blind. The purposeful. The Lord said, I called you for this purpose. Look at that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, and we're reading from verse 16. Acts. Chapter 26, we're looking at verse 16. It says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have called, appeared unto thee for this purpose, for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness, both of the things which thou art seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says to open their eyes. They were spiritually blind. They were blind to their salvation. They were blind to the Savior. They were blind to their prospects in the kingdom of God. And this is the purpose why God called uh, Paul, the apostle, he says, is to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. To turn them from the darkness of life and to turn them from the darkness of the gentle life and to turn them from the darkness of the unsaved. To turn them from darkness unto light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness. Those who have not received forgiveness and they have not received freedom, they have not received total conversion, they have not received total uh, kind of a surrender unto the Lord, they have not received the grace to be totally submissive unto the Lord without any rival. Those who have not got that forgiveness, they are blind. And it says, now you turn them from darkness unto, unto, unto light and from Satan unto God and to receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Isaiah chapter 42. We're looking at verse 19. Isaiah chapter 42. We're reading from verse 19. Who is blind? Who is blind? Who? The Lord is asking the question. He's going to give us the answer. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger that I said. Who is blind as he that is perfect? The one who says I'm perfect. Whatever I read from the Bible doesn't really matter. I'm saved. I'm sanctified, I'm baptized, and I know myself, I know my experience, and yet is blind to his condition. I guess uh, James and John were blind to their request. They didn't understand. They didn't understand that Lord, and they were so blind that they said, we can consecrate anything. And we can, we'll go with you all the way. We'll be baptized with the baptism you are baptized with. They were blind. And the people that were indignant, they were angry, they were blind. They didn't understand. They said, we have a right to be indignant. We have the right to be angry. And the Lord called all of them. He said, this is not the kingdom of the world. In the kingdom of the world, this is how they act. This is how they behave. And they never take correction. They just continue striking one another. And now he says about his own disciples, he said, who is blind but my servant? Are we blind? Do we have those blind spots that God has seen? that Christ has seen, that the scripture is revealing, and was still blind. Who is blind but my servant? And ordained as my messenger that I have sent. 
who is blind, a seed that is perfect, supposedly, and blind at the Lord's servant. That's why he calls us to reason. That's why he calls us to consider what we have heard. So that the messages given us from Matthew chapter 20 will not be lost on us. Then he tells us in verse 20, in verse 20, he says, seeing many things, thou observest not, and opening the eyes of other people, but he heareth not. I pray the Lord himself will open the eyes of our mind, the eyes of our soul, the eyes of our spirit, and then we will see the coming of the Lord, and by his grace, and by his strength, and by his enablement, he will open those eyes, then we'll see what we ought to see, and we'll come to the Lord, and then he lifts us up, and all the complaints forgotten, all the murmuring forgotten, all the indignation forgotten, all the anger forgotten, all the jealousy forgotten, all the place-seeking, position-seeking forgotten, all the scheming, everything forgotten, and then we're totally sanctified and we're ready for a new service unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I've heard a lot today and everything I've heard, I want that thing to be identified properly and I bring everything to you in prayer now and you will help me so that I do not go away from here tonight like I came in. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. It's a good God. It's a good God. He's giving us the parable. He's giving us the teaching so that our lives will be better. It's not to destroy us. It's not to discourage us. It's not to send us parking. That okay, that is so. Then I think I cannot again. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. He can do it. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Don't uh, you know retain the anger while you see leading the prayer? If you call another person to pray, remember that's my business between me and the Lord. Don't complain about anything. Just open your mouth and pray and say, Lord. Here am I. I want to change. I want transformation. And I want my life to fit in to the calling that you have given me. Tell the Lord, tell the Lord. The Lord will do it as you call upon him. Are you idle? Not reading the Bible? Are you idle? Not having quiet time? Are you idle? Not praying? Idle in prayer. Idle in soul winning. Idol in the work of the Lord. Idol in the work of our hand, the natural, physical, a business we have to carry out so that what we'll have will earn our own living. Tell the Lord, bring that laziness and idleness before the cross and before Christ and say, Lord, take this idol habit, indolent mindset. Take it away from me so that, Lord, I'll be up and doing. I'll wake up in good time. I'll go to work, find work, and do it at the right time. Don't be a lazy person that has thrown off your first faith, your first love, your first commitment, your first eagerness to do something profitable. Let idleness get away from your life and for your soul. That this is the time to pray and prepare for heaven. That you're not idle in preparing yourself for heaven, saved and living the life that shows the evidence of salvation, sanctified and having the mind, the heart, the transparency that shows you're sanctified. Not saying one thing with the mouth and hiding the real intention in the heart. Sanctified. So that you'll be fit for the master's use. Not idle. In being the person you ought to be. 
not idle. As a servant of God, and then don't make idle statements. Idle statements. When our hearts are changed, our language will change. Our expressions will change. Our interaction with others will change. Our communication will change. Consultation will change. You're no more a part of any conspiracy. That's Christianity. That you are saved, you are sanctified, your heart is cleansed, and your statements are gone, gone forever. Tell the Lord, and all of these positions seeking, or the way gain. I trip others so I can be a pastor. What do I gain? I deceive so I can have what does not belong to me. What's the gain? You follow the path of Absalom, scheming, dramatizing. Lying, pretending. What did Absalom gain? What do you gain? You bring politics into the church, into the ministry. You're gambling with your soul. What are you going to gain? I knock down that one with hate speech. With your imagination. So that others, they're even afraid of you. Because they know that you have the scheming, the gambling. The Absalom spirit. What do you gain? Eventually, such a person will be lost forever, like Absalom. What do we gain? Tell the Lord, He has opened our eyes to what we ought to be, how we ought to live. I want to think about heaven and heaven alone. At anything I'm doing, people may praise, people may lift you up. You might get something out of it. That something will burn your hand and burn your pocket. Sanctification, holiness, the most important thing any position, any power, any privilege, they mean nothing without holiness. Have you realized that servants of God could be blind, blind to their future, blind to their relationship with our God, blind or just going on just running you are running with your eyes closed you can't see the ditch the cliff in front of you you can't see the pitch in front of you and you are running at the highest speed and yet your eyes are closed open your eyes stop stop running and look around Look at your life and see, are you going the direction of heaven? Closing your eyes and running a race that will not lead to heaven. 
Let the Lord work in your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God at the headquarters and everywhere. Amen. Raise up those hands. Father, we thank you for your revelation. We thank you for your word that has come straight to every heart. We pray, Lord, all idleness in business, idleness in prayer, idleness in commitment, idleness in consecration, idleness in idle talk, idle conversation, idle statements. Take them away from our lives in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, in the real sense, we'll wake up. In the real sense, our sight will be clear. And I pray, Lord, that all these other things of the past that has made us just be running the race with our eyes closed, take everything away from our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Cleanse everyone. Amen. Wash us clean. And let our lives now shine as shining stars before all men. And let there be transparency in every life let there be transformation in every life and lord whatever the gain will be whatever is a penny or whatever reward let's leave the reward in your hand and keep on serving you wholeheartedly and earnestly and profitably in jesus name we're asking oh lord that all the unsanctified attitude on sanctified disposition, on sanctified character, on sanctified communication, all on sanctified scheming. Lord, I pray, wipe everything away from our lives in Jesus' name. Help us to be focused and sanctified. Help us not to have attitude of, okay, if that is so, what does that mean? We will we'll continue the word. You know, Lord, help us to hear the voice of the Spirit. And help us to yield in total consecration to the Spirit in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, the faith for deliverance from any blindness and any yoke. You are firm and confirm in every life. I will pray, Lord, you will not continue to follow the way of folly and the way of danger. And your blood will so cleanse us and put us right and focus our life on the goal ahead of us in Jesus' name. And when the Lord shall come, we pray that, Lord, you will keep and every one of us will be ready in Jesus' name. All the distraction and all the things that were picked up on the way, uh, just position, power, uh, ordination, whatever, all that take away from us and help us to have a single mind to enter into your glory when you come in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you and good night.